Hello there, you're very welcome to episode 12 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here. What an episode we have in store ahead of another cracking weekend of action. In just a moment, we're going to be joined by Dundalk's captain Stephen O'Donnell to talk about recent games against Cork and St. Pat's and look ahead to first v third this Friday then with the RSC. It's Waterford against Dundalk at 7.45. We'll also be joined by a man who we hope will be in direct competition with Stevie on Friday. That's Waterford midfielder Gavin Holohan. Shamrock Rovers head coach Stephen Bradley and attacker Graham Burke will look back on the win over Cork and ahead to the match against St. Pat's this Friday. We'll also hear from the Cork manager John Caulfield, St. Pat's Simon Madden, while our first division focus will bring you again the now world-famous interview with the cabin TD manager Eddie Gormley over the floodlights. We're going to hear from the Athlone manager Aaron Callahan as well and be joined by a Shelburne fan live in the studio to talk about the new owner Andrew Doyle and Chief Executive David O'Connor they held a fans forum at Talca Park on Tuesday night very positive by all accounts we're going to be joined by those lads very shortly as well we'll kick things off there with Dundalk's Stephen O'Donnell who joined us on the line Stevie how are you? Bad how are you? Stevie great thanks thanks very much for uh, taking the call uh, let's first see it's been a very very um, busy period for yourselves at Dundalk Stevie and all the League of Ireland players as a senior pro in the league now how have you found the fixture schedule of playing Friday, Monday, Friday, Monday for the last five or six weeks? Yeah, it's obviously very um, it's tough on the body yeah, I've not been too bad I've sort of been just coming back so I haven't played in every game but a good few of our lads have played in every game so it's obviously uh, a quick turnaround and you know it's tough on the body tough on everyone's body and um, you know it's up to the managers I suppose and our manager to decide who he thinks is looking fresh and who can, what, what players' bodies can take that load and what lads he needs to maybe give a rest and give a breather so Hopefully our big squad and our, our, our squad that we think is you know has a lot of strength and depth, hopefully that will stand to us over this busy period. Yeah, I didn't actually realise until a couple of weeks ago when I really looked at the fixture schedule properly that over 36 league games, they're playing 24 before the summer break and there's 12 afterwards. Now, the idea of that is to avoid you know clashes for Europe and also the FAI Cup, but it is very, very heavily loaded towards the, the first part of the season and we've seen that with Monday crowds being uh, dropped off and as you said, the managers probably can't pick their strongest team each Friday and Monday because the players will just be wrecked and injured by the end of it. Yeah, I think there was a good few cases of lads getting injuries on Monday night in, in different games around the country. So, uh, um, you know, it is sort of, does seem very lopsided before the break, you know, even for fans trying to go to games. As you said, the attendances, I think it was nearly, it was nearly half of what, of the adult attendances on, um, on Friday. Granted, there was a big crowd down in Turner's Cross for Cork Dundalk, but, you know, it's very costly for supporters to try and get to every game. They're going to have to kind of pick and choose what games to go to and, even to, to go and watch the matches, you know, it's it's nearly impossible for for teams to perform to their maximum ability. You know, if they're if they're being if they're being thrown out every three or four days, you know, for five or six weeks solid. So it's just, I suppose, if it's a bit of a war of attrition at the minute, who if you could just stay stay going and not and drop as 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 few points as you possibly can and just hang around around there for us up around the top, you know, after this hectic schedule, we'd be happy. Yeah, certainly, Steve, you're now at the top of the table. 31 points from your 14 games so far. And you mentioned the huge crowd down at Turner's Cross on uh, Friday of last week. 6,672 was the attendance. Uh, a 1-0 win uh, for Cork in the end. A very scrappy game by all accounts. I know you were an unused sub, Stevie. Your manager, Stephen Kenny, said after that he wanted his team to play more good football and probably hinting the same about Cork, that he wanted there to be more quality on show in the football match. Cork, I've seen a couple of times recently, they're quite direct, play lots of, of long balls and your manager wasn't overly happy with the pitch either. What was the game like? Because it is the showpiece of Irish football currently, 7,000 fans there and, and by all accounts, the, the football, the actual football on show wasn't fantastic. Yeah, I think it's been a sort of, it's probably nearly been a constant in Dundalk Cork games of, um, they haven't been probably the best games to watch, you know, uh, over the previous couple of years, I think a lot got to do with there's so much probably at stake and, you know, with a big crowd, a packed house, um, players are sort of very wired up for it. And sometimes when when lads are that wired up for, for a game and that, you know, the thought process and the, the sort of bit of relaxation on the ball that might go out the window. So, you know, it wasn't the greatest game in the world, but um, I thought maybe first 20, 25 minutes would be like that and then it might calm down. But I suppose the game never really calmed down at all and then, um, you know, it was sort of Helter skelter for the full ninety minutes. So um, you know we'd be more just disappointed with the result, I suppose. Um, lose a one nil game where I probably I felt we probably didn't deserve to lose. But there are things. Uh, it seems to be the first goals were crucial in, in a lot of the Cork uh, Dundalk games of the last couple of years. So they managed to get one in the second half, and you know we'd 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 a fair few chances, but just couldn't convert one. 
Yes, and of course, uh, the results then on Monday, Stevie, with you guys beating St. Pat's 5 0 and Cork City, a game I was at, badly losing 3 0 to Shamrock Rovers, kind of flipped things again in terms of the league table. A 5 0 win, as I mentioned, over St. Pat's. Patrick Huben uh, with two goals uh, seven minutes after half time. Ronan Murray, Michael Duffy, and Jamie McGrath, the 85th minute, a 5 0 win. You were um, on the pitch for that game, Stevie. You started the game. A fairly comprehensive win and uh, lots of good goals. Yeah, good win, even at nil all. We did nil all at half time. Um you know, we were the dominant team. We missed a, a hat full of chances and you're be a bit worried that maybe it's one of those nights. But we got a, we got a fortuitous enough early goal right at the start of the second half and that really set us on its way. So we actually, we played good football. We played uh, we played very well on Monday night, you know. So, um, you know, it was a good way to bounce back. But as you said, it's flip, it flipped from Friday night and, you know, with all the games coming thick and fast, there's going to be more twists and turns. So, yeah, you don't have time to dwell on, on victories or defeats at the minute. It's just going on to the next game and making sure you're you're prepared and ready to go three days later because we don't want to be feeling as flat as we were last weekend. We want to have a feeling that, like we had on Monday night, you know, feeling the satisfaction and being at the top of the table. So it can change real quick and we're well aware of that. So we're concentrating on Waterford now on Friday. Yeah, Stevie, I mentioned uh, you know a couple of the younger players in the group scored on Monday night. Michael Duffy got the fourth goal and Jamie McGrath got the fifth goal. Michael Duffy's fantastic strike and you know he's been in really good form. Interested to get your thoughts on Jamie, who I met up with last week. He uh, sat down with me for a chat, and I was interested to speak to him about you know his physical development over the last year and uh, you know how strong he's become you know physically to look at him and clearly also when he's playing in football matches. And he mentioned the likes of yourself and Sean Gannon and Dane Massey, you know some of the senior pros in the group. They've been a big help to him in the gym. Just talk to us about that because the transformation he's made in his body and his strength is fantastic over the last year or so. Yeah, well, uh, at the end of the day, it's down to it's down to the player. You know, you can um, the player has to want to do it himself. And Jamie has a great attitude; he always has. So, I suppose he's just bought into it and seen other lads sort of floating. Up, up, other lads have maybe gone away, and other lads that have really progressed at Dundalk. How how dedicated they were and what they done with their bodies, and them. You know, he wants to follow suit. He's his whole career ahead of him. You know, he has all the talent. He has the hard bit of having the natural talent and having um, you know the, the touch and that and the skills so you know he can anyone can do what what he's doing at the minute now and that's going into the gym building himself up making himself more robust and you know we're reaping the benefits of that you know so he got his goal on on Monday night and hopefully that will kick him on again to get a few more goals because as I said he's 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 a great first touch and that's probably the best first touch at the club and then um, you know, he's just very naturally talented and he has a great attitude along with that, so I can't see any 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 reason why he doesn't keep progressing. Yeah, and of course, I know another man who's helped him hugely in the gym is Graham Byrne, who was the Dundalk fitness and, and trend and conditioning coach up until this week, and Dundalk announced to Stevie on Tuesday that they can confirm Graham Byrne, the club's trend and conditioning coach, has left Oriel Park to explore new opportunities. Byrne joined the club ahead of the 2013 season and was a member of the backroom team for a success in the FAI Cup, in the Europa League and in the league titles. Dundalk Football Club would like to place their record uh, on record their thanks to Graham for his hard work, commitment and professionalism during his time at the club and wish him well in his future endeavours. How come he's left, Stevie? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not privy to that. Um, you know, all I can say is we went on a great adventure from 2013. I think when Graham came in, you know, we've we've had massive highs and lows as a team and uh, as a squad. So, you know, it's um, you know, he's done a great job. Obviously, people we've kind of raised the bar. I said, I, I'd say at the start when we when we first came in Dundalk, and you can see other teams now sort of you know really delving into the strength and conditioning, and I think the fitness and the the strength of the league and the physical power of the players in the league, you know, has really gone up a couple of levels. So, um, you know, he's a, he's done a great job, and um, you know, everyone everyone would like to wish him the best in the future. But I don't know. It's not my concern of why Graham think he's gone. I don't. I actually don't know any of the reasons. So, um, you know, you'd have to ask, you'd have to ask the club and ask Graham that. But um, you know, all we can do is thank him for his efforts, like every. Like all the other previous players and management that that have come and go, you know, we've had a great time together, and um, you know, there'll be more people sort of coming and going in the next few years. That's just the way football is. I'm interested uh, just to get some more of your views on the way football in this league is going, Stephen. And you know, Dundalk have been the team who have you know broke new ground in terms of fitness and you know having Graham there involved in the staff and, and the amount of work I mentioned Jamie McGrath but all of the players the senior players including yourself to be able to play so many games particularly in that season when you were playing in the Europa League group stage and you nearly played for the full calendar year you know nearly a match every three or four days for that whole period it's something in the league now that all clubs are, are trying to do Dundalk were the leaders but it is a very important part of football now is to be physically fit and strong and eat well and it's something that Dundalk as I said have been at the, at the front of 
Yeah, definitely. Look, you look at the game, I suppose, last night, the, the pace and tempo of that game, the Bayern-Real Madrid game, that's the elite level. Uh, not with, like, all with, with the skill and the, the touch and the movement, but the pace that they were able to go at for the full 90 minutes, hammer and thongs for the full 90 minutes, um, you know, obviously it's a watered down, um, watered down level, the League of Ireland compared to that, but, you know, it's all relative speaking and, and the, the progress we've made from in the last few years from... Um, what the League of Ireland was, I suppose, and the athletes that were in it, and even how you treat your off season and that, and what shape you come back in for pre season, has changed dramatically. And I think uh, all clubs know there's an expectancy on players to come back in reasonable shape and and be able to really get going straight into pre season at a high level. And you can see that with the with the with the pace and power of a lot of players in the League of Ireland. Now it's definitely gone up a few notches, and it has to, I suppose, it's. It's the same in every sport, you know, with technology and, and the athletes are just getting bigger, stronger and quicker. So, um, you know, football's no different than you have to go with it. You're on the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here speaking to Dundalk captain Stephen O'Donnell. We look back on the games against Cork and St. Pat's. Now it's ahead, Stevie, to Friday, 7.45 in the RSC. Third place Waterford against yourselves, of course, who are currently top of the table. You played them already once this season. A 1-0 win for yourselves in Oriel Park. Uh, they come in just three points behind you, one of the top teams in the league, and have done really well in their first season in the Premier Division. What's your views on the task ahead on Friday, Stevie? Yeah, I was asked a question about Waterford, or not a, about Waterford, or who do you think would be challengers at the start of the season? And I said, Waterford are going to be challengers. And people, I suppose, raised a few eyebrows because they're only after coming up. But they'd signed very good players. And, um, you know, it's it's been proved right that they're they're bang there now, Waterford. And I don't think it's a case of a good start and they're going to drop off. They're going to be right there till the end of the season, I think, because they they have good players, a good squad, and Alan Reynolds doing a, a great job down there. Um, and you add into the fact of maybe they have no Europe, you know, when Europe comes around, so they'll have extra time to prepare for their games and that. So, um, you know, they're going to be a real, real force. And you've seen that with the results um, the results they've had. And we, we, we managed to scramble a last minute winner against them in the first game of the season at Oriel, or first game we played them at Oriel. So, um, you know, Friday's going to be very difficult. They have a lot of attacking threats and. Um, you know, they have a good spine all the way down their team. So, you know, it's going to be a very difficult game. And as I said, we don't have time to dwell on the Pats game. We're, we're really looking forward to going down to Waterford and hopefully getting a po- positive result. Yeah, it's interesting as well because, you know, speaking to uh, Stephen Bradley after the match, the Shamrock Rovers Cork match on, on Monday, he was speaking about playing with three at the back for, for the last couple of matches. And I know from watching Waterford, Alan Reynolds likes a, a 4-4-2 diamond as such with, um, you know, Izzy Akinade and Courtney Duff is up front. And, of course, they have uh, Bastianeri and uh, Stanley Abora back now from suspension as well. Um, for you as a player in midfield, if you are playing on Friday against a diamond with two strikers, Waterford like to play to their strengths, get the ball up to Akinade, who's very powerful, Duffus, who of course scored the winner against Bowles the other day, and they've got some very talented midfield players as well. It's an interesting way they've played, and it's worked well for them so far, and something you'll need to try and deal with to the best you guys can on Friday. Yeah, definitely. I suppose all managers pick their team, um, what, what, whatever type of players they have, you know, to pick a system to suit the players they have, so... Uh, obviously, Andrew Reynolds feels that this is his best system, this the best way of playing, and it's proven that it is a three-point dividend. So, you know, we are under no illusion, no matter what system or that. You know, at the end of the day, football is mainly about players, so we're under no illusions that uh, whatever system Waterford play, they just have good players. That's the bottom line, and they're going to be a real, real tough test down in Waterford on Friday with with a, with a real vocal support behind them. You know, after such a good start to the season, I'm sure. The whole city's rolling in behind them. We're rolling in behind the football club, and there's going to be a good atmosphere there on Friday. You know, we have to be ready for it and, uh, you know, try and pose our game on them. Yeah, of course, they've had some great crowds as well. They've had a 2,100 at the game against Sligo, uh, the 2,200 against Brain. Another big game recently when Cork City travelled that, that game with all the red cards. There was almost 4,000 fans at that game, so we're hoping for another huge attendance at the RSC this Friday. Stephen, finally, for the last three or four years, it's been a shootout between Dundalk and Cork for the league title. Many people feel it may be that way come the business end again this season, but at the moment, Waterford are, are very heavily involved. We've seen Derry City since they've gone back to the Brandywell. They've been fantastic, scoring lots of goals, playing great football. Shamrock Rovers bounced back from a month without a win to beat Cork 3-0 on, on Monday. What's your assessment of, of kind of that, those top four or five? And for you, do you enjoy and are you enjoying a league where there's more big games and more teams involved or would you prefer it to be just yourselves and Cork as it has been for the last number of years because there's definitely more better teams in the league this year that feel they have a chance to finish top come the end? Yeah, definitely. There's more depth in the league this year. I think it's better for the league when there's more teams involved. You know, 
it gets maybe a bit monotonous for people when it's it's, um, it's only two teams, obviously not for two teams involved, but I'm just talking about the league in general. It gets a bit bit monotonous maybe for people when there's only two teams going for the league every year. So, you know, the more teams involved, the better for, for the league. And I think there will be more teams involved this year. You've seen teams that are capable of going on big runs. I think Derry are on a long, unbeaten run. Uh, Waterford are obviously up there ourselves at Cork and Rovers. You know, had a big win against Cork on, on Monday night. So they'll be able to go on a run. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of twists and turns. I think this year it won't be anyone sort of flying away with the league as that there's going to be points dropped by by everyone. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to make sure that we're the team with the least amount of points dropped come come the end of the season. And, you know, we're, we're happy enough with our start. We know we can get a lot better and hopefully we will as the season progresses. Yeah, certainly been a fascinating start and a long way to go, of course. That game, Waterford against Dundalk, 7.45 in the RSC this coming Friday. Dundalk, Stephen Donald, thanks so much for your time. The best of luck on Friday. We'll speak to you soon. Lovely, thank you. That's on Docs. Stephen O'Donnell from him to a midfield man who might be against him this Friday, the RSC. It's Waterford's Gavin Houlihan. Gav, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, but not too bad. Gav, thanks very much for uh, taking the time. It's been a very good season so far for Waterford. You're uh, currently third in the table, a few points off the top. Uh, fantastic home form, particularly great crowds at the RSC, some big wins. How's life as a blue this season? You're probably quite happy. Yeah, delighted at how it's gone. Um, couldn't ask for a better start, really, and um, you know we're we're probably ahead of schedule where we want to be in the league. You know, um, I don't think a lot of people would have expected it, but you know we put in some great performances, and um, you know I think we're you know we're there on merit, and you know deserves to be where we are at the table. What do you think have been the keys to it so far? You know, the team last season in the first division did so well. That momentum of winning football matches has clearly continued into the Premier League. It's a very good squad, Gav, but the league that you're in now is much better than the one you were in last season. So there still has to have been a lot of work done to prove, you know, the point that you're a really good team and you're so far third in the table. Um, well, I suppose, you know, there's a few factors, obviously. I think, the, you know, the quality of, uh, you know, the players that we have at the club and, um, you know... Uh, the determination and everyone to to do well and be successful. You know, with, you know, there's a lot of a lot of experience in the club, and you know, we, you know, with a lot of winners in the club. So, I think that's pushing us on every week. Um, and, you know, and we're obviously we're putting in some good performances and you know showing our qualities. And um, I think I think we can only we can only get better as well. I don't think we've uh, we've believe it or not. I don't think we've actually really hit top form. Yeah, that's uh, certainly uh, a warning sign for some of the other uh, teams towards the top of the table. Gav, you've been playing this season under Alan Reynolds with a, a 4-4-2 diamond for much of the season. Of course, with um, Big Izzy Akinadi up front alongside Courtney Duffus. Courtney got the winner at Bowles on Monday night. and A diamond in midfield, which you've been in, involved in, along with Stanley Abora and Bastian Airy and the other player in that force has kind of changed over the weeks. It's an interesting system and one that seems to suit Waterford quite well. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think it's um, you know it's a, it's a difficult system to to get right, but I think when you do get it right, it can cause teams a lot of a lot of problems. And you know, we found that this year that you know a lot of teams have struggled to kind of you know get on top of it when we've played. And you know, I think you know, speaking for myself in the midfield, I think you know we complement each other really well. Uh, in with the you know the other three boys, and you know, we we all have different qualities that we can bring to the table, and it's uh, it's been working well. And hopefully, long may it continue then. Yeah, because it's something that not over many teams in the league will play with. And, you know, all four midfielders are all very good passing footballers. But particularly with Izzy up front, and, you know, he did it very well with Bowles last year in, in being able to, to stretch the game and link the game and get himself in positions to hold the ball up. It means your team can play two ways. You can play passing football through the middle, but you can also go a little bit longer to Izzy or to Courtney, who's, you know, an old soul number nine himself and well able to look after himself if the game is more physical. Hello. How are you? Can you do? You, do you hear that question? Sorry about the the, the lines after going there again. No problem. I was just asking about the uh, the different ways that you guys can play with the talented midfielders you have with the four of you, but also with Izzy and Courtney up front as two also number nines who can link it up, link link it in and and get in the box. The team probably has two different ways to to actually play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, you know you have you know two big strong lads up up top, so. You know, like I say, if we we, we want to play through the lines and um, you know put the ball down and and you know move the ball around the pitch, but you know of course not every game is going to suit that. You got to you got to kind of have a a different way of playing, and you know we have the the option of obviously going a bit more direct to the two boys, and we know obviously once we get it up to them, you know they're both physical and strong, they can hold it up and bring others into play. 
Yeah, and again, it's been it's been you know a massive help to you to have the two front players in the team, and you know in certain games as well where you're playing against teams who might be strong in wide areas, you've been brave in terms of the manager Alan Reynolds has, has picked the same shape and picked the same team against the likes of your Corks and your Shamrock Rovers and your Dundalk where you've gone with the system that you guys feel will win you the match and every manager always says listen we're more focused on ourselves than the other team and that has really proven the case with you guys this year in playing to your own strengths Yeah definitely yeah I, can, I think you can see it you know and, you know, and that's kind of have to take your hat off to you know, the coaching staff you know, to have us going out playing, playing the right way and, and, and the way that's going to you know, kind of you know, help us as a team and kind of help help each individual player with their you know different strengths. Um, you know, I think it's been working this year, and where we've been we've been playing so far. Like I said before, you know, I think we've we've still got a few more levels in us as well. You know, I think there's still still a you know a bit more to go, um, and you know we're obviously in a good position in the league. So hopefully now if we can keep on improving now between now and the end of the season, you know, we can keep pushing on up the league. Yeah, in terms of the project Waterford are, are trying to build, the crowds have been fantastic. We know that Pat Fennan was director of football. He stepped away, but is still, I believe, doing some work for Lee Power. And then you've got Alan Reynolds as the, the first team coach. The team are full-time training in the mornings. All you guys are, are, are there full-time. And I know some commute and some are living there. Where is the project at now overall for, for us? That, that you know We can see behind the scenes. We can see you playing on a Friday or a Monday night winning football matches, but there's lots of stuff behind the scenes that's going in to make that possible. You might just tell us a little bit about that and, and how that's all working. Yeah, but there's a massive amount going into it, and you know we see it obviously uh, the stuff going on behind the scenes to you know to you know advertise every every home game and make sure that we're pulling in big crowds, and you know that's that's a lot to do with you know the people behind the scenes that you wouldn't obviously you wouldn't think of first and foremost, but you know they deserve a lot of credit for it, and and then like like I said, everything else is is in position for us to be successful. You know we have you know top strength and conditioning coaches and, you know, you know, doing proper gym sessions, you know, the meal meal planning and everything like that. So um there's everything being put in place for us players to obviously be successful. You know, it comes down to us obviously performing on a on a Friday night, but everything that's that's being put in place behind us is obviously helping us helping us do that and helping us um get get positive results anyway. Of course and another group of people Gav, who've been helping you getting positive results are the fans, the attendances of the RSC this season. You're one of the most, I would say, behind Cork and behind Dundalk. You've had, you know, the best home crowds of the season. More recently against Sligo, there was two thousand there. The same against Bray, you had almost four thousand there against Cork, three thousand there against Rovers, so on and so forth. For you guys playing, how has that been? You know, the RSC at times with the track around the pitch. If the if the crowd is low, it can be you know, a very eerie place to play football. But when the crowds have been high and those two main stands have been full, it's been a great atmosphere for you guys to play in and the home support, the people have really bought into what the team and everybody is trying to do this season. Yeah, and, you know, we've been, we've been pulling in, you know, big crowds this year and, you know, speaking, speaking from experience on, you know, on a Friday night at home, the atmosphere that's, that's been created is, you know, it's, it's something else really. You know, the fans really do get behind us and they're always in full voice, whether we're, you know whether we're winning the game or, or or losing the game, um, you know they don't stop singing and 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 shouting us on and you know and that's a that's a big help to us. You know there are twelve men and the help us the help us in the you know the tight games where they could go either way. They're they're the ones that are kind of pushing us on to to get over the line and get the results. So yeah, those home crowds Gav, have been fantastic this season. That hopefully helped cheer you guys on against Dundalk. You played them already this season, um, and it was a one 0 victory for Dundalk in that game. A late goal, as far as I remember. What's your thoughts on facing them on Friday? And if you do win, you'll be level on points with them at the top. Cork, of course, play on Saturday. So you could be joined top at the end of the, the action on Friday if you can go and beat them on uh, Friday, 7.45 down at the RSC. Yeah, uh, like I said, we, you know, we only narrowly lost up there. You know, it was a last, last minute goal, which is, which is a tough one to take at the time because you know, I think we, we put in a, a good performance up there and I think we probably deserved the draw on the night. Um, you know, although they were putting on a lot of pressure at the end, you know, we ne- we nearly nearly got out of there with a point, so it was disappointing from that point of view. But I think obviously we could take that performance um, as a positive going into to Friday night, and you know, and knowing that we can we can match them if if we're all uh, at it from the start. And yeah, and like I said, we well, hopefully we'll have a big crowd as well. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough game. Um, they're they're going to be obviously up for the game and. They'll be looking to come down here and get get the three points, and you know we'll be going out looking to get the three points. And like I said, we, we can we can obviously go. I think it's joint top on the table. Then obviously if we can, if we can get the win, which would be nice. So um, you know it's going to be a big game, and you know we're looking forward to it down here. Kevin Hoodland, thanks a million. The best of luck on Friday. 
Cheers, Chad. Thanks for that. Yeah, that is the Waterford midfielder Gavin Houlihan ahead of a massive game this Friday. It's at the RSC in Waterford. Waterford against Dundalk with a 7.45 kickoff. Now, Monday night at Tallis Stadium, Shamrock Rovers sprung a kind of surprise, really, given recent form. They beat Cork City by three goals to nil. Graham Burke scored an unbelievable opening goal. If you've not seen it, find it on Twitter. Type in Graham Burke. Find Shamrock Rovers on Twitter. You will see an unbelievable right-footed strike. The Ireland manager, Martin O'Neill, had just sat down and uh, he really enjoyed it. Um, and after the game, I caught up with uh, Graham Burke. But firstly, here's the Shamrock Rovers head coach, Stephen Bradley. I thought the players were, were excellent. I thought they defended really well when they had to, played some really good football. And, and we got that bit of luck in the final tour that we haven't been getting the last few games because up in Derry, we were excellent, should have won the game. Limerick, we were excellent, should have won the game. And tonight, we, we got that bit of luck in the final tour. We've had many views of many Graham Burke brilliant goals for Shamrock Rovers. What was your view of his opener tonight after two and a half minutes? That's a special strike. He's... he's um, Anywhere 35 yards out, Graham, left or right foot. He has the ability to put it in the top corner like he did tonight. And some of his goals this season have been unbelievably. He might have a goal this season, highlight reel all to himself. Some of them are, have been frightening, but I thought his all-round game tonight was excellent. Yeah, he went from the opening goal to creating the second for Ethan Boyle, a corner, and then creating the third for Roberto Lopez as well. So he's as important getting assists as he is getting goals. Yeah, he's, he's been excellent. His all-round game has really come on. He's matured, um, he's playing more for the team now. And when he does that, off the back of that, he can um, create some unbelievable chances for himself and others, and, and that's what he's been doing for us. Court on can see too many from set pieces, so he must have been really pleased for the first uh, corner for Graham, for the second goal, and also the wide free kick for the third. You've been able to score two set pieces against them. Yeah, they're a big physical team, but we feel that uh, physically we can, we can match them in the box now. And, and uh, I think we look dangerous every every corner and every free kick we get. Some of the deliveries from Graham and Brandon were excellent. And it was about attacking the right areas, and I thought we did that really well tonight. If I was to ask you to name your man of the match, was it Graham Burke or was it your goalkeeper, Kevin Horgan, who made three great saves? Two of them have to be in the save of the season uh, category. The one from, uh, I think was uh, Buckley, the header in the first half, and then also the double save from Cummins and McNamee. Cl- you know, top-class saves. Yeah, his saves are unbelievable. He showed unbelievable character, Kevin, the last few weeks because uh, a lot of people have been having posh shots at him and I thought tonight he showed unbelievable character and has done since then. He made some great saves. There's so many. To pick out one, uh, if you're forcing me, Aaron Bulger, I thought was unbelievable. You forget he's 18 years of age and, and he's uh, walking around there like he's played 400 games. I thought he was brilliant. Just on the goalkeeper, Kevin Horgan, he did make a mistake in the Dundalk match. He did take a lot of stick online, a lot of you know, pundits and stuff are having a go at you for picking him, having a go at you for signing him. You guys have signed Alan Manis, he's coming back in July. But performances like that, Kevin Horgan will still be wanting to fight to be your number one. 100%. Yeah, we, we knew that before we signed Alan. We explained to Kevin yeah, what we're doing, no problem. His answer was he has to come and take my jersey and that's, that's the attitude of the kid. And, and uh, when he plays like that, I thought he was unbelievable. Brings you on now nicely to another Dublin derby against St Pat's on Friday. Yeah, uh, we go there full of confidence, unbeaten in three, we're playing well and, and uh, we go there ready to go. And just finally, you mentioned about the pot shots, Stephen, and people have been taking pot shots at you over the last month, the first winner of since I think March 30th. How were you, I know the, the Bowes game was you know last minute drama, then there were two more defeats and then the draw against Limerick. How were you in that period when you knew that people were having a go at you and you know, some of the fans weren't overly happy as well? No, look, the fans have a, have a right to be frustrated or angry at a certain point in time. Uh, we lost two games and and uh, it just happened in a short space of time and games we, sh- we should win. So I understand the frustration. In terms of outside, our manager of the biggest club in the country, I'm going to get criticised. I have no problem with that whatsoever. And when the fans do have a go, you know, they were here, 1,900 people here tonight showing their support again. They've stuck with you, you know, clearly this result tonight will give everybody a big boost including you but you know at times like that it's your first job as a senior manager was it a hard period for you when you knew that the fans weren't happy and maybe when the result went up on Twitter there was a few of them having a go and, and wanting you out basically when the club have kept you and you've just gone and beaten the champions Yeah I've said from day one we've got a plan here nothing's changing uh, we don't panic when we lose a game we don't panic when we win a game we know we're a good side um, we had a bad two two games five days we had a bad five days and uh I get the frustration at times, but well, we've got to understand what we're building here in terms of a team and a club. And um, I've got good people around me, staff, and, and the board of being different class. They they understand what we're doing, they see what we're doing. And um, we're, we're not a million miles off, we just need to keep our heads down and keep working hard. 
And just on that, finally, um, you know, a lot of the under 15s are here most weeks doing ball. Boy, there's a lot of younger kids even here now watching us doing the interview. A lot of the younger Shamrock Rovers fans do come to watch, and it is a big project that you're overseeing with the training ground and the academy and everything else that's going on. But it is important, clearly, that the first team are winning as well. Just talk to us about that comparison between what you're trying to build as a club, but also it's very important that the first team do perform and do win because, you know, that's the main objective of the club. Yeah, no, we've got to win games. There's no, no one has said to me it's okay to lose games and everything's all right. You're a manager of the biggest club in the country. You have to win games. I get that, and and we always understand that. First team have to win games, um, but what we're doing here, both as a team in terms of what we're building and as a club, uh, I believe the future's bright for this club. And, but we can't let one or two bad results uh, over five days dictate what happens here. Um, we know we're going to have really good nights late tonight and some bad nights, but you got to stay with it, stay focused, and and keep believing in what we're doing. See, Brady, well done. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, that's the Shamrock Rovers head coach Stephen Bradley. Interesting views from him over there after their 3 0 win against Cork City on Monday night at Tallis Stadium. The man who opened the scoring was Graham Burke. He made the second and he made the third, and he was a, quite a happy man when I spoke to him afterwards. Well, Jamie, I told you when we sat down on the podcast, I just hit them. And uh, lucky enough, I was surprised with that one because it was in me right foot. You know what I mean? I didn't expect once, I knew it. I'd seen a flight of it when I looked up and looked at it, I knew it was, it was going in, and then I just got a bit of movement on the end. and... Yeah, it is another nice one, yeah, to be fair. Has every goal you've scored this season been in that category? They've just been, you haven't scored a tap in version yet, but they've all been really, really good goals. Yeah, I think a couple, a couple of them have been uh, from outside the box. And I think only against uh, Derry that night, I think uh, they were the only ones that I think came from inside the box. But other than then, you know, if you watch me play, you see me, like, you know what I mean, try them shots, like, take as many. I think I had another one after, after I just, um, that McNuckley saved, and then the free kick I hit from Tig, like, I just try to hit them. If they go in, they go in. If they don't, then I still won't stop trying. With the, with the way the performances and results have been, results certainly in the last months, to start like that against Cork in Tallis Stadium in an important home game, what was a big, a, a really good way to start the game? Yeah, I think last week against Limerick and then against Derry, we were, we were right bang at it in the first half. Last week against um, Limerick was disappointing the way we came out in the second half and to give away the goal that we did. And then down in Derry, we felt like we came away from a game that we should have uh, we should have won we hit the bar a couple of times a few chances from set plays but like in front of the goal we haven't um, like really um, put them away oh sorry uh, put them away like you know so lucky enough tonight uh, they came off for us and uh, we ended up scoring three but I think on the last three games we've been very good just unlucky not to get results but obviously disappointing against battles and when you're down torn up in such a big game I think like that game we just never showed up. Every single one of us came there with like not the right mindset or whatever and we uh, we just didn't show up and that night we got a lesson and um Bray like down there. T- same two conditions were bad. But I think like going away there, I think we should have won the game. And then obviously on the back of that we've had really good performances but we didn't get the results and then tonight lucky enough we have. Happy for your manager Stephen Bradley as well. He took some stick on Twitter in the last month. Obviously the club has stuck with him and the result tonight probably you know backs that up. The team have been playing well in the last couple of games, bar maybe a couple of poor performances. But happy for him too that you know a result like this can hopefully really kickstart the rest of the season for you guys. Yeah, obviously this result can kickstart. I think like we started the season really well and gone down to Waterford. We get the three points against Waterford. We go top of the league and then think after that like we play really well against Dundalk and then we've got bad performances. You know what I mean? But the Bows game is. That's down to us. That's not to do with any of the staff or that and with tactics or that. That's just us blatantly not going out and performing. And then the same against Bray. Like you know what I mean. The conditions are very bad. Like, but I don't think anything is in the blame should be on the manager. I think that's just down to us not not performing and not taking our chances when they arrive on the pitch. And just finally, a word on another Dublin derby this Friday against St Pat's. They were uh, well beaten tonight. I think five 0 by Dundalk. So you'd be hoping to pick up more points in a, another derby this Friday. Yeah, hopefully when we play Pat's, it was a great game got the own goal there that's really all that was in that game but we'll go there with confidence after tonight and uh, hopefully go and uh, get the three points points will be a very difficult game and obviously diaries are a completely different game so hopefully we go there if we show what we did tonight hopefully we can get something from the game Graham Burke thanks a million well done cheers thanks Shane Shamrock Rovers Graham Burke scored the opening goal after just two and a half minutes an absolutely cracking strike with his right foot now the Ireland manager Martin O'Neill had just taken his seat for the match when Greenbrook scored that goal. And we spoke to Martin at the launch of the FAI Summer Soccer Schools on the, uh, Wednesday afternoon, no, Tuesday afternoon at the Aviva Stadium. And uh, Martin gave us his views on the game 
Graham Burke's performance and if someone like Graham and his form here in Ireland could get back to England of course Graham a former Aston Villa star I think one thing you also saw last night Martin was uh, Graham Burke banging in a 30 yarder you just taking your seat last night in Tala what did you make it again? I stood up and saw the goal as he's just about to hit it in and uh, it was a great goal and it set the tone for Shamrock Rovers I think you know they'd been under pressure a little bit to try and get results they had got the draw at the, at the, at the weekend so and that goal just gave them, gave them the proper lift just early on in the game and you'd have to say deserve to win the match. Cork, unusually for them, conceded a couple of set pieces as well too. And but I've no doubt that the uh, Cork manager will uh, will right a few wrongs during the next few weeks. He's been um, in terms sorry in terms of Graham Burke scoring fantastic goals. He played for one of your former clubs, Aston Villa, for a number of years. He's come back. He's doing really well in the league. I think he's played for Ireland up to the 21s. Mm-hmm. For someone like him, if their form is that good here, do you see a possible route back to the UK for him? And are those the type of people who you would be keeping an eye on in case they do go back and do do a Sean Maguire or something and, and perform really well? well, the, well the, there, there, there are a number of players now who have gone uh, who have gone over to England early on and had to come back. There's no reason. There's no reason for. And there might be a number of reasons why they didn't make the grade. They might have been homesick, for instance, the the the, the perennial problem. Or they might just the, the other players just might be better than them. But if this is an opportunity for the lads to to regroup, go again, get a bit of confidence, and he, and he's doing very very well at this minute, and wants to try it back there again, that's all well and good, I think, you know, and. Um, you know, for instance, I remember when I came into this job. First of all, um, I went to see some players um, uh, playing in in, in England. Uh, the little lad uh, playing left back for, or, sorry, left wing back for Shamrock Rovers. There, he played for Fulham. Sean Cavanagh. Absolutely, he he was playing. He was playing intermittently for Fulham. He, he played quite a number of games, but obviously, as Fulham improved, they didn't think that he he was to the to the standard. He's come back now. And um, and you never know. Let let's see whether he wants to try and get back again. But the, these a number of these players now in the last four years have crossed my path, and um, and I've uh, or my path I should say singularly, and um, and there, there, I think there's always room for improvement. The Ireland manager Martin O'Neill speaking to us at the Sports Direct Summer Soccer Schools 2018 launch at the Aviva Stadium. Now another interested viewer at Tallis Stadium on uh, midweek was the women's national team manager Colin Bell who was at his first ever Men's League of Ireland game, so we had to ask him what he thought. You've obviously been at a number of Women's National League games in the League of Ireland. I know you were at your first Men's League of Ireland game live last night, Shamrock Rovers against Cork. Just interested to get your views on the, your first experience of the Men's League of Ireland and the game you saw last night. Yeah, I, I don't really want to analyse the game. I don't feel as I'm qualified uh, to do that after just watching one game. And I was, I was really impressed. Um, I, I, I was very you know, pleased to be there. Um, and of course, I looked a little bit at Shamrock, uh, maybe a little bit closer because, um, you know, playing with a back three, back five, which is a variation that I like to use. Uh, and I thought uh, the guys did it really well. And, uh, you know, congratulations on Stephen, um, you know, for getting his team really well set up yesterday. And I think it was definitely, you know, well-deserved uh, victory. Um, good atmosphere. The crowd, you know, got behind the team. Great start. Um, yeah, so it was interesting. I'm, I'm definitely won't be the last time I'll be there for sure. A great night for Shamrock Rovers. Not such a great night for Cork City and their manager John Caulfield, who spoke to us afterwards about the three 0 defeat to Shamrock Rovers. It's a scenario where um, I keep saying the next game is more than most boring game, and uh, you know while Friday night the lads took the plaudits. You know I keep saying after the match the focus on tonight, but you know unfortunately we were second best by a long way, um, and. Um, Rovers played really well. Rovers are a team to win the league. You know, they start out the start of the season. They, you know, no matter what they say, they believe they can win the league, and they're going to have a huge say in the league. And uh, you know, if they get another three or four wins under the belt, they're right back in the title race, which you'd expect with a team like that. And um, but at the same time, for us, you know, we conceded um, after three minutes. Um, you know, Graham obviously great strike, but we all know Graham Burke is a fantastic striker of the ball. We'd already spoken about it. We missed the header, lost the ball, backed off, and he struck a great goal. And um, and then they scored two more goals from set pieces. And um, you know, obviously Kevin Hogan, in fairness to him, he probably made three world class saves there in the first half to get us back in the game. So maybe we got back in the game, but overall, you know, as I keep saying, your next game is the most important game for us. And um, tonight. You know, Friday night is over. Tonight was the next part of the game and we weren't good enough and we were well behind. 
Now we're coming into the game, Cork of course have beaten Dundalk by one goal to nail a massive game and it put them back at the top of the League of Ireland Premier Division. For Shamrock Rovers, they hadn't won a match in the whole month, but they did pick up those three points. And John Caulfield says the form leading into the match didn't really tell the story of what was actually going to happen on the pitch. Well, Shamrock Rovers is a top quality side. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's loads of managers out that would love to be managing that team. They're fantastic players. So, uh, yeah, they went through four or five games that they hadn't, they hadn't done well. But at the same time, uh, like they were desperately looking against Dundalk. They should have certainly got a draw and, um, and they conceded soft goals. They should have won at Derry. So, you know, these things happen, but, um, you know, Stephen has, has to turn them around. So it was always a dangerous match for us. I knew that. You know, the key for us was that after Monday night, you know, you can make excuses about the games and just, which it all t- takes its toll a bit, but at the same time, we're one down after three minutes and uh, we're two down after 20, giving away a set piece. And, um, you know, as I said, maybe if you go back to 2 1, it was a different game, but we didn't. And uh, we can see the two set pieces tonight, and it's unlike us, but, you know, it's a learning experience because. Um, as I keep saying, a lot of young fellas coming in, they're doing great, but, you know, today open their eyes and I keep saying, you know, um, you know, consistency will de- decide whether our players are going to be good enough at this level and uh, you have to be consistent. So we have no excuses tonight other than we have to get act together for, for, for Saturday, which is our most important game now. The Cork manager, John Coffey, looking ahead as well. They're going to play Limerick this coming weekend. The game is on Saturday. It's in Turner's Cross with a two o'clock kickoff. That's Cork against Limerick, hoping for City to be able to uh, bounce back from there. Now, a big game in Dublin takes place. It's going to be St. Pat's against Shamrock Rovers. It's in Richmond Park. It's a 7.45 kickoff. And uh, we're now going to hear from the St. Pat's right back, Simon Madden, who spoke to uh, stpatsfc.com on their Facebook page about their defeat 5-0 against Sundalk on Monday and ahead to facing his old club, Shamrock Rovers, this Friday at 7.45 in Richmond Park. Yeah, we're doing all right in the first half. We probably could have keeping the ball a bit better, but as you said, Jake had a great chance. Well, it was offside, and Duna had a great chance to score as well. But listen, that, that's the way games go sometimes. But um, we have to move on to Friday now. So St. Pat's have been really good from a defensive point of view in recent weeks, but did concede five goals in that second half against Dundalk. And Simon Madden has been telling the St. Pat's Facebook page that he was quite surprised at uh, their defensive performance in that second half. Yeah, it was a shocking start. It was a, a poor goal, really, to concede. Um, the ball just tripled in, like, with a bad deflection. But, listen, after the first goal, we just had to regroup. But, they, as you said, they scored straight away to make it 2-0. And as Aussie went 3-0, you find it hard, hard it's t- uh, tough to get in the game. To get three points again or getting a draw. But, listen, that's the way football goes. I didn't really see that coming, five goals. Like, I don't think it really was a five-goal uh, thumping as a finish. But, um, as a back four and a keeper... And, Obviously, as a team, really, we're disappointed to score five goals and not to score any goals. So, um, yes, we have to regroup today. We have to recover and hopefully be back in training Thursday and look forward to the game on Friday. Now, no rest for St. Pat's. They're going to welcome Shamrock Rovers to Richmond Park for a 7.45 kickoff this Friday. Of course, Simon Madden is a former Shamrock Rovers player and he's really looking forward to the game and the Dublin Derby atmosphere. Yeah, it's quite strange. Um, obviously, going back up there in Tallaght uh, a few weeks ago when we got beaten 1-0, it was a, a strange experience, but... Listen, that's in football like you're going to play against former teammates and former teams so obviously it'd be great now to get three points which we badly need now yeah it's a perfect game for us it's at home hopefully you get a big crowd um, be a good atmosphere same as last Friday in the Dublin Derby but we have to get a positive result so what does Simon expect from this Friday's Dublin Derby yeah it's just a great buzz great buzz before the game and in the game you can feel the fans giving each other a stick and listen, it's a great, great atmosphere to play in obviously better when you pick up three points Simon also knows that points are a must given the league table and trying to catch up with that top four and stay near the pack going into the summer break. Points against the direct rivals for Europe like Shamrock Rovers, he feels are very, very important. Yeah, it's massive, especially if you want to look up the table instead of down below us. We need to have three points, we need to go on a little run. Obviously we went three games unbeaten there, but we have to start picking wins after wins and climb that table. Yeah, what a big game for St. Pat's against Shamrock Rovers. This is coming Friday, Richmond Park, 7.45. Bray Wanderers against Derry City kicks off at the Carlisle Grounds. Not a great couple of weeks for Bray. They've lost against their relegation rivals. They lost, of course, uh, to Limerick and they've lost to Sligo Rovers. So their task about staying up looks difficult at this stage. They're nine points away from safety. Still only 14 games played for them. They've got a game in handball. They do need to start picking up some points as soon as they can. So that's a, an important game for them against High Fly and Derry City. St. Pat's against Shamrock Rovers, 7.45. Waterford against Undock, which we previewed as well. And those two games on Saturday, it's Cork City against Limerick at 2 o'clock. What are the quarter to eight in the Sligo showgrounds? Sligo host Bohemians, another team who do need to get some points. That is our Premier Division focus here on the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. Time now for the First Division.
Yeah, you're on the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here alongside Darren Cleary. And we'd like to welcome to the studio a Shelburne fan. His name is Shane Dawson. And as you know, on Tuesday evening of this week, Shelburne held the first fans forum in a number of years at Talker Park with new owner and investor Andrew Doyle and chief executive David O'Connor speaking at the event. And we've just got some time to speak to Shane now. Shane, um, firstly, it's the first we, time in a, in, a, in a long time. Are we? Are we in the dark here? Yeah, that's why... What's wrong? Well, that, that's why I stopped talking, because the lights are gone off. That's why I, I just stopped there for a minute, because we're what, in pitch darkness. What's happened? It's Cabin Tealy all over again. Did, what's, what's wrong? Well, we're in the dark, and they're not talking to me, so... Do, do, do you know what happened? Yeah, they don't know what's happening, no. Do you know what's happened? No. Will just said they don't is know what's happening. Is it the generator? Oh, is, this, is this actually a practical joke? <laughs> oh my God, I cannot <laughs> believe they've done this. <laughs> The worst practical joke in the history of off the ball ever. I'm having it, oh. I'm having it. Do I look like an electrician? <laughs> no, you don't actually, and neither does Eddie Gorman. We're going to speak to him later, so can we leave that, please? <laughs> is this going in the outtakes or what? I can't this believe it. This will be in the real show, Jamie Moore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having that. Not funny, the lads out in the, out in the box are laughing, not funny at all. Are we starting again? Thank you, lads. <laughs> no, keep Will, I was wondering why you were here. Oh, I want to learn how to see the studio, wasn't that it? <laughs> Eddie Gormley, are you here? How do you, the lights how do you feel now when someone grills you about something that's nothing to do with you? But if that happened in, in the off-the-ball shoot in the middle of an interview, I would go, excuse me, we need to stop. This is an absolute disgrace. We have no lights and we're going to get them fixed. And I am actually a qualified the, electrician. What, are you hey. a qualified yeah. electrician? You I'm are not. It, there was no answers, to be fair. I felt fixed uncomfortable. It. As a guest here, I felt uncomfortable. I felt more uncomfortable yeah. for poor Eddie Gormley. <laughs> I should have actually known what was going on here. Anyway, <laughs> can we move on, please? The worst practical joke in the history Shane, of... Shane, welcome to the Cheers, League of Ireland podcast. Cheers. It's Cheers. good to have you here. We're not actually that unprofessional. That was a joke on Jamie's expense. No, that's fine. He's not really great with jokes. He doesn't really get them. But that was meant to make you laugh, Jamie. So okay. that I'm was laughing. real. Not, not good with jokes, good with he's grilling la- managers. He's laughing inside. Um, Shane, in all seriousness, another big First Division story. The Shelburne meeting. You were there. I was there myself. What are your initial impressions? Was the first chance we got to hear from Andrew Doyle and get some sense of the man? He spoke at length, an hour and a half, two hours, to kind of give details about himself and why he's involved. What did you take away from, from what you learned about him? Um, overall, I think it was, it was definitely more positive than negative. Uh, it was nice to put names to faces. It was nice to see a good crowd there. Like We've been at fans forums over the past number of years and there's been a handful of people there. So it was nice to actually see a good crowd there and have a bit more informative answers now having said that I think there was a lot of words spoken but possibly not a, a lot said um, I think Andrew from initial first impressions I've never had dealings with him before in the past and it was nice to kind of just welcome in, welcome in into the club really same with Sean same with Dave O'Connor the CEO um, and to kind of get their initial thoughts initial viewpoints he comes across as an excellent businessman which he is you know his, his track record stands for himself with Maples and Calders etc etc and his football dealings, I don't, we haven't learned a lot from that. I mean, he's come in with four point strategic plans, seven point teams, which are, are all fantastic on paper, but it will only be a case of time will tell whether these materialise into anything else. He's put a lump sum into the club, which is brilliant. You know, we're debt free as of now. He's coming in, and I'm not worried that he's coming in with a view to take a ground or take any assets because we don't have any. So it's a positive step in that sense. Overall, it's the, I suppose it's the most positive kind of atmosphere that's been around the club in the guts of 10 years, really, you know? Yeah, it's exciting from that side. And I certainly, listening to him, I was immediately struck by the fact that he is either a guy who should win an Oscar or he's probably being sincere because he seemed genuinely passionate about developing players and developing people and in some ways it was comforting not to dwell on the first team's fortunes there was a good bit about the first team obviously is what keeps the fans involved and what keeps the show on the road but he seems to want to build a legacy and he seems to want to restore Shelburne to where it was uh, the interesting part for me was it, it was very much about the the sense was it's not about coming here to just pump money 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 in and see Shell make the same mistakes they made a decade over he wants to put this into a functional business where they make their own income, they generate revenue. That was very positive uh, from my perspective. I thought he dealt pretty well with some difficult questions. I thought he was straight away put on the spot and pushed for specifics on who are you, what are you doing, why are you doing it. Obviously, 
we would have reservations about a guy who was working with Shamrock Rovers a couple of months ago, left under circumstances no one's particularly sure of why he was involved for a time there and left there and why he would then want to invest in, in Shelburne. I think, for me, I left feeling pretty positive. Some fans might have differing opinions, but the fact that they are trying to do stuff that has not been done in a long time is encouraging, I think. Oh, definitely. I think it's vintage Shelburne scepticism. You know, you know, you have to be sceptical about these things. This is a man who's coming in, and the only reason he's putting money into a football club who, you know, were definitely on its knees at the time, is because he's passionate about football and he wants to give back to the community. You're never going to have any monetary rewards for investing in a League of Ireland club, investing in a football club overall, most likely as well. But I want to know why he's here in terms of, is this a man of, let's be blunt about it, a man who's retired early and has got a bit of cash to spend and just wants to invest in a new project, and that seems to be the way. He mentioned last night that he pretty much you know, educated the Shamrock Rover CEO in what he knew, and if that's a case of what he's going to do now with our current CEO, um, Dave O'Connor, because he is only young, he's only in his mid-twenties, is a man with not a lot of experience who will be taught by Andrew's uh, business background as well. I mean, this is a man who, I think at the end of 2009, uh, the Dublin firm turned over 18 million. He was in charge of 120 people. This is a man who can manage a business. So from that point of view, I think it's excellent. From what I gather from talking to current board members as well, he's the man who pushed that DCU deal over the line. And it's a fantastic um, deal for the club as well, to nurture players, to nurture talent, and then to have a player pathway coming through to the club as well, like that. So I think in that, in that sense, it has to be positive. Now, he did mention, and I'd be somewhat worried, you know, if we do go up this year, is this a year too soon? Because if we don't have annual income that meets the targets that he wants, he's not going to invest another lump sum. So I don't know if it's a year too soon that you want to build, or I'm not sure how many years his project is overall. Yeah, he's not. He, he accepts that he's not going to make money here, but he's not going to run a charity either. Exactly. I think you actually asked him what happens when there are two sums we understand. He's paid a sum to assume majority control of the club, so he is de facto the owner. He has a controlling stake now in in Shelburne Football Club, and he also gave them a loan. He said he doesn't expect to receive any of that money back. And you asked the question, what happens when that money goes? Do you go or do you put more money in? And he kind of said, I don't want to be in that position. I want to be in the position where I've given Shells the tools to start making their own money and stand on their own two feet. He has some ideas of how to do that, which you know we won't get in today. We let the club themselves explain it. But I do believe that he's very much so, I will help you out because you're on your knees. But after that, when you should be walking, I'm not going to hold your hand forever. I feel like if he was a bike, he would be the stabilizers. He was, he was here to get us standing and moving, but they come off and then you're out on your own. But it's 100% that analogy of being a bike and being a stabilizers. Shelburne need that because of the way the club has been in recent years. Shane, how long have you supported Shells? And in that time, how many you know, occasions were you aware that the fans asked for information, asked for meetings and were told no? And in the first couple of weeks of this new tenure, Andrew Doyle and Dave O'Connor have fronted up and stood in front of Shells fans, including you on Tuesday night, and answered questions. And that's something that you guys have wanted for a long time, most recently about the deal over Daily Mount and Daily Mount Move. And answers were not given. That was been a huge criticism of the previous people in charge of the club. who did a lot of great work, but never spoke to the fans. So for Andrew and David to stand in front of you guys and answer questions shows that they do want to help and do want to be open, doesn't it? It does, but I think that was in place just as the deal was kind of coming into, uh, t- what, what, just as the deal was taking place behind closed doors. Listen, I've no problem putting my name to, I was part of, of you know, protesting fans last year, I was part of a, a boycott as well of Talca Park because of lack of answers, lies and misinformation spread about fans. But I'm happy to also say that has ceased. We've talked with current board members, we're in communication with that now and changes are happening. And the changes of that happening as well stem from Doyle and O'Connor, I'm sure, but I think it is current board, board members as well. Listen, I like no Joe Casey. He's a decent man, and he's got a lot of stick. You know, sometimes justified, sometimes unjustified. But there's people. Someone has to be accountable. You know, and questions have to be answered. And I think Andrew is going to do that. The, you know, overall the book stops with him. Um, now he seems to be a bit of a jovial character. You know, he can brush off a question. He can make a joke. Now I don't know. Like he's a obviously international law firm. I'm not sure if he's the the Irish Harvey Specter here or whatever. But you know, I think his passion, his enthusiasm and his knowledge is going to resonate around the board then as well. So you have, you know, board members who've been there for a long period of time who are going to have to change in their ways or 
they're probably going to move on. And I think looking, just sitting, looking up at the top table last night was a case of, and Andrew actually referenced it himself, the majority of that board are 50 plus white yeah. males. And now with Shauna coming in marketing, with young Dave O'Connor coming in, it's, it's vi- you know, vibrant, youthful kind of energy that you want. And I think with that comes answers to many questions that may have not been there in the past. But what yeah. you change as well is you get people who have fire fought for so long, they've kept the show on the road without the current board and they do deserve an awful lot of credit because they've been the custodians for the club for 10 years and kept it alive when most sane people would have walked away. What you get though with the new influx of people are people who aren't afraid to fail. They haven't been through the ringer. They're not broken by disappointment. They have a fresh outlook and they have an enthusiasm to, to try new things. That Not to say the old board would be stuck in their ways, but they're very much, they know how to keep the show on the road. They know how to keep it afloat. That's why they're so important to this project as well. These new people want to do things differently. They want to try and make money. They want to tap into to wells that are so far being untapped. And I think that mix is particularly encouraging. I thought they spoke really well about volunteers, the lifeblood of the cu- club. Uh, they talked about improving links in the community. Bows deserve massive credit. They have been brilliant in Fibster and Cabra in the last few years in making Bows the club that people of that community, they don't feel like they support it. They feel like they are it. And I think that's where Shells have failed for a long number of years. They never properly ingratiated themselves into Drumcondra. They didn't shy away from that last night. They said, well, we're not about just Drumcondra. Well, why not just get the Drumcondra people in and then build from there? I think it's positive if they are trying to become an overarching entity in the community and try and get people down. They were spoke so well about the community that that side of things I found very, very positive and very, very encouraging. Particularly after so many years, I mean, you and I have both been at these things where they've been fraught, they've been tense. There wasn't a whole lot of tension no. there last night. There was one moment where it was asked, you know, could some of the financial specifics be kept within the four walls here? And someone kind of sighed, but then it was there was the question of, do you have an issue? Would you like to say something? And the person got pretty quiet and it was left at that. So you do get people who will be frustrated and Shell's fans have a perversion for pessimism. They're they're so used to being beaten and being ground down over the years. It's hard for them to get excited about anything. And there are some that are still probably looking at this with a healthy dose of, of, I'm not so sure. But at the moment, I think there are enough things that have happened in the DCU deal, Andrew Doyle coming in, a fresh investment in the squad, and it was also noted that if Shells are in the shake-up or pushing for promotion, there will be money invested for Heary in the window to try and strengthen the squad. I think that's enough. They they've at least deserve a chance. Whether or not you want to buy into them completely, trust them completely, don't. You should never trust someone after the first date anyway, but you should also give them a chance for date number two. Yeah, I think I want to ask about the boycott and you mentioned Shane that you were involved as a number of Shells fans were in recent seasons of staying away from home games in Talca Park. I've just looked at the last four home games that Shells have played against Galway, 761 was the attendance against Atlone, 667 Cove was 602 and Longford was 682. The next home game is this Friday against UCD. It's a top of the table clash. UCD are top on 22 points. Shells are third, I think, on 17 points. It's a big game. Given what you heard the other night Will some of the fans who have stayed away start to come back now and give the new club and the new owners a chance and give the players, most importantly, and Onheri support in a very important match? Because if they want to go up as champions and the only way to go up automatically is by champions, you've got to finish top. And if they lose the game on Friday, they're going to be eight points behind. If they win the game, they're within two points. And, you know, the Shells fans probably do need to go, do you know what, I'm going to go back to talk and watch a game and give this a chance. Is that a possibility? Well, it is. Well, first and foremost the fans the majority of fans who have boycotted are back and that's what I was getting at in terms of this whole communication that has been opened between board and fans and you know I'm personally in contact with board members at the moment because we want to keep this going it's not just things are going to change now it has to be a constant as well I can count on my hand the number of fans that are still staying away and there's some maybe that may never come back but I mean if you can count on your hand, that's not going to make a huge dent in, in income. So I'm not worried about that. The fans who have boycotted, the majority of the group who have boycotted, are back. And we're back because there's been communication. We're back because we want to change things. And it's not all about we're back, give us this, give us this, give us this. We're happy to put things back into the club, be it fundraisers, be it anything like that. And to create an atmosphere as well. Like Owen Heary spoke about that. There was players who are used to 
who are playing for Shelburne who don't, didn't know what it was like to you know, play in front of a singing crowd. You know, we want to get behind this team and we want this team back in the Premier Division. You know, that's obviously the goal of ourselves, that's the goal of the Board of Management, that's the goal of all fans and it's also the goal of Andrew Doyle. Like He talked about his end goal ultimately in short without going on seven point plans and strategic stuff like that, reading off paper. He wants this to be a successful Premier Division club. And that's what everyone wants. But he also mentions sustainable development. And sustainable development means that you can aim to be a Premier Division club with attendances that can, you know, actually influence proper money. You of know course, I mean? and I think that's the point. And that would be a concern for me if you're saying that the majority of the fans who were staying away are back and the attendances are still in the six and seven hundreds. I know they're in the first division. Yeah. And, you know, fans will go to watch Premier Division games more, obviously. But, yeah, but you, you, get, you, you get there's barely any away gates in the first division. The first division... Yeah, I agree with th- that. Th- there's no way of kind of assessing the suitability of a club to survive in the first division because it's it's barely living there. There's no point in even imagining Shells improving and thriving as a first division club. It doesn't happen. There's no such thing. They need to get to the Premier Division st- status as Shane touched on. Maybe they need to do it in a time frame where if it comes next season or at the end of this season, it might be too soon. But I think that there's a massive, massive sleeping core of fans that... I've just fallen out of love. They're just they're lapsed. They have things to do on a Friday night. The first division's not that appealing. The match night experience isn't that appealing. You don't want to sit in a wet stand all night with a dead atmosphere watching a team whack another team 7-0. It's just not that interesting. It's not that appealing. I think you get up to the Premier Division, you get your Dublin derbies back, you get meaningful games, you get big gates from away clubs. It'll always be an occasion when Shamrock Rovers and Bowes and even now Cork and Pats and Dundalk come to Talca. If they're not back there, it's it's a no-runner. It doesn't matter how much money he puts in. It doesn't matter the best of himself and David O'Connor and everyone's intentions. If they're in the first division, there's no point. No, I would agree with that. And I think as well, you need to say that the gates in the first league, when you say the Derby's Bowls Rovers, there's a huge bounce of seven or 800 fans from the away teams. But from Shell's point of view, they do need to try and find some more people, as you said, in the area of Contra, in the surrounding areas as well. And I think the plan to try and improve their academy and have links with different areas will help. And I know one of their main plans is to improve the match night experience and have kids games at half time and have areas for families to go and watch the game and stuff because that's an important role. That's but not they- a concern though because I think like Pat's average attendance at the moment is 1,600. If Shell's were in the Premier Division, they would probably be between... 1400 and 1600 so I don't I wouldn't look at the attendance now and decide whether or not that would be a barrier to this being achieved I, I genuinely don't think if we're still achieved. challenging in from the latter end of the season that attendance will be four figures why is it not that way now though <sighs> Maybe Shells fans are fickle. Yeah, because I but, mean, like, if I, you look at the Premier, the, the first division, the last couple of seasons, I understand Limerick and I understand Waterford are not from Dublin, and there's so many clubs in Dublin. But last year, Waterford, the year before Limerick, they're getting crowds of over two, three thousand to their games because they're doing well. They don't have five or six clubs division. to compete with in the no, general region. But I still think, and if you were to look at the Shells attendances over recent seasons, they were always in around the six, seven, eight hundred mark while they were in the first division. And if, in the if, Premier if, Division, if you're if talking twelve or thirteen. sleeping fans around, but I think it was there was so much negativity around as well. The place there was. You were going down on a Friday and you were nearly dreading going down. You were just doing it for the sake of it. You know, now there's actual enjoyment back and that's what we want to bring as well because without that enjoyment of the match day experience and stuff like that, for whatever group of fans you are, be it your family, be it your elderly fan, be it uh, a singer in the newsstand or whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? That enjoyment is back now and that is only going to continue to progress with that. It's not an overnight job. People have stayed boycotted away and, you know, they've found different things to do on a Friday night and it's out of their rhythm and their routine. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. now you have to bring that back and once that comes back, it's it's going to be a gradual process to attract fans back and with success comes more fans. So if we continue to be successful, more fans come back hopefully um, and then if we went up again, I'd, I'd be confident the fans coming back as well. Good, and I think that's an important thing from Andrew Doyle's point of view that as much money as he's putting in and they're trying to attract new blue chip sponsors and, and get you know do different events, they also want the cash coming in every second week of punters paying their money because that is the cash that runs a club and that will definitely be an important aspect of it. I think from that point of view, if they want to attract more young people to the games and this isn't just a shell problem, it's a League of Ireland problem, is the behaviour of some fans in the grounds and the language out of them and it's not just an Irish issue, it's everywhere in the world like, is disgraceful. And I wouldn't bring my kid currently, a young kid, to watch a League of Ireland game in certain places. Because, really? Where? Yeah. Most of Which the stadiums in Dublin. All of them. And I'm not talking about the facility. I'm talking about the language of some adults towards 
The referees that happens towards in schoolboy football. That's no, I, I'm sorry. I'm, there's family sections. Shells have been up for awards for family sections as well. But you can still that hear can the be shouts. integrated. Yeah. No, I remember when I was a kid. If you and go I was to going the, to the AUL on a Saturday, you'll hear that. It's. I agree with you, and it should. It needs to stop, but it needs to come from the other people in the stands to demand that you're supporting your team properly, and that if you're you bringing your wife and your kid, that they're not hearing every curse word under the sun about the referee. And some of the fans are are, are <sighs> mental. I don't need well, that. What's the, what's the solution for that? You want to. I want the fans to language? behave themselves properly. Yes, I do. From from language. Yeah, I think I'm I think saying personally, I don't have kids currently. When I do, I would not bring a young kid or a young. I've got some little cousins and whatever, and you know, I wouldn't bring them a little brother. And he's fifteen, sixteen now, so that's fine. But when they're younger, and it's not just I'm not just saying Chelsea, I'm saying all the clubs. The language out of people, adults. You, you, you see an adult when he works in the bank till five o'clock, goes to a football match and becomes crazy. That's not just a football issue. You get that with any sport. Yeah. People are letting off steam or whatever. I'm not justifying it, but it, it is a case of that's. You, you hear that walking down the street, you could hear someone cursing as well. It's. Uh, I think that's. Not there there, that there could be, re- be many reasons not to bring a young fan to a club, and I, I, I want more fans to come to clubs. Definitely, I'm not saying don't stay away, but I, I genuinely think that's a non-issue. It's. It's. It's a bit of bad language. Yeah, it's I, a bit of bad language that turns people off going to games. I don't think it does. I think it if definitely you, does. No, you, if, you, if that's your excuse, it's a piss poor excuse if you'll excuse the bad language. Because I just think if if you're that exercised about it, you're just looking for excuses. You're not I looking for excuses. You're looking for people to behave in a way that is in an environment surrounding young it's people. It's not ballet. I know it's not ballet. I'm not suggesting it's, it's ballet, it's, but it's, I'm saying it's 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 We can't go to a football match just to cater for a handful of young children as well. You're there. You're not. You're there to support a club. And if you if you shout in in frustration or anything like that, so be it. I like it's 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 a, just a way of life. It's English English language. Yeah, but the point I'm making is, and if shells are trying to attract more young people to the games, and by that I mean these half time matches. I don't think shells are in this conversation. I don't think this is it. I know, but I'm making it's a broad conversation, and I was in. Uh, watching on Monday, I was at Shamrock Rovers. I was at Richmond Park the previous uh, Friday night. There's young kids playing in the halftime matches, correct? Yeah. And normally, what happens is these kids get in for free. Yeah. The parents get half price tickets or quarter price tickets or free tickets or whatever. It might be the first experience of a League of Ireland football match. And if I'm a parent and my kid gets to play at halftime, it's great. But I hear some 50 year old man screaming and shouting with C words and F words every, every time there's a decision against them. I'm not going to bring that child back to the game. I'm just not going to do that. If it's my first experience of it, I'm not going to do it. And I don't think that could be argued with. Maybe take up a hobby then that has less passion. It's not passion though. You you can express passion without being abusive and screaming and shouting and cursing. You really, you really (sighs) can. I really don't. We're nearly running out of time. I need to ask you one more question each if I can, and that is: at the meeting on Tuesday night, give me in thirty seconds each the most exciting thing that you heard, and if you think it'll happen, and what sort of an impact that will have on Shelburne's positive future. Uh, Sustainable development, uh, the partnership with DCU, actually focusing proper community grounds and proper links to that and that can only progress the club long term and it's not just a, a two year plan to try and get to the Premier and then go back down again and have nothing to fall back on. Darren? For me the excitement part is volunteerism and, and trying to improve community links that are have been next to non-existent for a long number of years. I think Andrew Doyle made a very good point that resonated with me. He said problems lie in the past and solutions lie in the future. I think give them a chance give them at least a few months to try and put their stamp on the club. You can be sceptical, you can ask as many questions as you want, but don't do it on the internet. If you've got something you want to know, go down and ask someone. Go up and ask Joe Casey if you see him. Ask Andrew Doyle, ask David O'Connor, ask whoever you want. But come down, give them a chance and give them the benefit of the doubt. Let them have some chance of succeeding. Yeah, we have been in touch as well with Andrew Doyle and with the new CLC executive, David O'Connor. They're not doing any media at the moment, but they have promised us they will speak to us in the near future once they get settled and their feet under the table. Shane, finally, big game Friday. Uh, Shells against UCD and Talca. Your thoughts, we're going to go through the fixtures just now in a moment, but just your thoughts on the game. Last weekend, James Inger scored a brilliant equaliser up in Drogheda um, to secure a point. Shells, as we said, 17 points from the game so far. What's your thoughts on welcoming the team who are currently at the top of the table to Talca? Hopefully a busy Talca this Friday. Massive Dublin derby. You know, that's it's where it's at. Um, listen, if, after the first round of games, if you know someone's to say that Shells would be in that position where they were, I'd happily take it. Um, you know, we played them in the first game of the season as well. It's a case of I was happy with the point up in Drogheda. Um, it's not an easy place to go, especially with the, with the team they have. I'd be hopeful of of a win um, on on Friday, and to have to be two points off UCD, I'd happily take that. You know, I you know a lot of fans were kind of talking about being playoff contenders. I wasn't actually even thinking about that at the start of the season. I didn't think we'd be there thereabouts. We are, and there's no reason why this can't continue, and there's no reason why we can't beat UCD on Friday. Yeah, that result as well last weekend. It was Drada 1, Shells 1, it finished Galway 3, 
Cove nil down there. And the other game on Friday, a thriller at the UCD Bowl. UCD 3, Wexford FC 2. And reports in the news this week that Georgie Kelly, the UCD striker, could be on the way to Dundalk in the transfer window, which will be good news for Shells and not good news for UCD. On uh, Saturday, Finn Harps beat Logford Town by two goals to one uh, down there. A last-minute goal by Sam Todd secured the points for Finn Harps, an important win for them. And the other game on Saturday was in Stradbrook, and it finished. Oh, wait, it didn't finish. Captain Healy were beating at Lone 1-0. Kieran Marty Water scored... And the lights went out. And uh, we had a little joke at the start of the segment about the lights going out here. Thankfully, we've paid our electricity bill, our generator's working and we have our lights. Cabin TD didn't on Saturday. If you miss our interview with the Cabin TD manager, Eddie Gormley, who wasn't too happy, here it is now. Eddie, what's your understanding of why the game is being called off tonight? The lights weren't working. Any idea why? Not electrician, Jamie. Don't know. We've heard that it's possible that the generator wasn't working. Like I said... I'm focused on the game, I don't know what's going on. All I'm told is the lights aren't working, so the game was called. So, that's it. I mean, the game itself, we might as well talk about that because I was more interested in what was going on in the pitch. If we can stay on the lights for now, because it's clearly another negative news story involving the league and a first division club. The lights did come on in the second half and went off again. Listen, Jamie, I'm a football manager. I'm not an electrician. You want to talk about the lights? Go and talk to somebody that knows something about generators. I don't know anything about generators. Speak to me about the match. I'm not speaking to you about the lights. There's nothing to do with me. So I asked to speak to somebody from Cam Tealy about the lights and I was told that you were the person I was going to speak to you about it. So I'm entitled hang, to ask no, the no, question. No, hang on, Jamie. You can ask me about the match because I'm here and in football capacity. Not about a set of lights that I know nothing, nothing about. I'm not an electrician. Don't ask me to change a bulb because I wouldn't be too clever at changing a bulb either. If you want to talk about the football match, I'll talk about the football match. I don't know why generators blow or don't blow nothing to do with me you yeah, know I'm, I'm not suggesting it is but as the captain mm. TD manager on the night are you disappointed mm. that the game has been abandoned because of course the I'm disappointed we're one nil up yeah. we're one nil up and the game gets abandoned in an ideal world the lights stay on we finish the game out and hopefully we see it out and that's that's everybody's happy but it wasn't to be it looked to me as if the game could have continued it wasn't dark enough in my opinion for the game to be called off the players seemed to feel the same I think it was 20 minutes left when the ref yeah, called it everybody's disappointed because we want the game to continue by the looks of it, it's only that long because they don't want to obviously have to travel back up um, but the man in the middle makes the decision so he felt the forward official said to me there's, Eddie there's 23 minutes plus to go we feel like we can't get to the end if something happens to a player you're looking at insurance reasons I obviously understand that so for the safety of the players they call it off you can't really argue with that do I agree with him? unfortunately I do because at the end of the day it's about the player's safety Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.